Okay, so in chapter 41, uh, we're talking about species interactions or community ecology. Now, when we look at um, what is a community, well, here we have a population of frogs as a population of flies, and we know that frogs eat flies. And so um, that is one way that these two populations interact. But it's more than just these two populations. You also have the plants that the frogs could live in to camouflage um, and hide from their own predators. So here you have dynamics within a community. You have predators, you have prey, you have shelter um, from like using plants or maybe you're a bird and you live in trees. <laughs> and so when we look at um, how different, oh, there's another predator there. So when we look at how different populations <laughs> interact. Um, we call this a biological community. So it's a group of different populations of different species living close enough together to interact. And so how um, an organism interacts with individuals of other species in a community are called interspecific interactions. So that's why I have the interspecific interactions because that means different species. Whereas if you're talking about um, competition, for example, within the same species, so if those frogs, like frog one, two, and three, are all competing against each other for the flies, then that would be intra, with R-A, intraspecific um, interactions or competition. So in community ecology and in this chapter, what we're looking at are the different ways that populations interact with each other to make up a community in an ecosystem. So we're going to look at five different types of community interactions in the beginning part of this. So we have competition, predation, herbivory, symbiosis, and facilitation. And so when we look at um, this population of frogs here, um, we see that there's flies. And so here you have, um, ooh, we got some, I think they're chameleons. Uh, the flies are the frog's food, but it's also the chameleon's food. So what you see here is competition for resources. Here they're competing for food. But in nature, animals also compete for space. They compete for um, shelter. They compete for uh, water. If it's um, uh, plants, for example, they would compete for nutrients in the soil. So there's all different kinds of competitions for resources. In this example, it's two predators competing for the same food. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and summarize what a community is in your box one. All right, so now when we look at a community um, in a little bit more detail, we also see how um, different components of the ecosystem, so when we talk about biotic or abiotic factors, can also influence the different communities that exist. So this is a picture of my husband on one of our first backpacking trips in Colorado. And here we just pulled off of a trail and set up camp on the side of a mountain. Um, and you can see this is the trail that leads into the trees, or in reality, out of the trees. So where we were camping in Colorado, we were very high up, and uh, the air was so thin, we were about 11 to 12,000 feet high. Um, the air was so thin that it couldn't support photosynthesis for those pine trees. So here you see um, in this back over here, you can kind of see how um, the trees kind of stop growing. So what we have here, this is called tree line. And so the difference abiotic factors in an ecosystem can also influence the community um, that can that can survive. So where I'm standing is um, only enough, the air is so thin that you only have small amount of plants that live. And with that, you would also have, um, oh, we were hiking to this lake at the top over the side of a mountain. Um, but in this uh, very high altitude ecosystem, you can see here, here's a marmot that only lives at high elevations. So you have different communities depending on um, the different abiotic factors that are present. Okay, alrighty, so now competition, let's go back to that. So what we're looking at now 
are the five different types of interactions between species that I just previously mentioned. So in competition, what you have is you have inter-specific competition, and uh, it's really not a win-win for anybody because they're constantly struggling, constantly competing for the same resource. So if a skunk and an owl are competing for food, yeah, in this case, the skunk won, but in future situations, sorry, future situations, the owl might win. So it's a constant struggle between these two species to compete for the same food source. Um, so here's words. Uh, individuals of different species compete for research resource that limits their growth and survival. So when we look at um, like a graph of population size over time, um, if you have two species that are going to be competing, here's species A living by itself, and then species B also on by itself. But what do you think is going to happen if we put these two populations um, together and have them use the exact same resource at the exact same time. Like think about if you have just the owl um, hunting for mice, it's going to survive and thrive. And then you have the skunk. If you have just the skunk alone without the competition of the owl, it would also be successful. However, if you put them together um, in the same location to use the exact same resource, they're not going to be as successful individually. So when we look at this, usually one species is going to outcompete the other species. And you can't really have two species that use the exact same resource in the exact same way living together in an ecosystem. There's too much competition and it will be detrimental for one of them. Um, so I want you to think for a minute, what does this tell you about how species A and species B, um, how they interact together? So how I would interpret this is that species A outcompetes species B for the resource. Whether it's two different types of birds competing to live in a tree, or um, like we saw the owl and the skunk competing for the mice. Uh, so usually the inferior competitor is locally eliminated, um, meaning that their habitat or what we'll learn soon, their niche or their niche um, can't really overlap too much. So this is called competitive exclusion. When you have two different species going through inter-specific competition, one of them is going to outcompete the other, and that is competitive exclusion. One's going to be excluded because of competition. Okay, so if you could go ahead and summarize competitive exclusion in your box too. All right, so here's a cute little burrowing owl. Um, my mom actually lives um, in Winchester and has seven acres, and next to her property, there's an endangered burrowing owl. So she has biologists come quite often to check on the population. I had no idea that owls burrowed and lived um, underground. I just assumed they all lived in trees, but apparently they do. So um, let's think about this. What abiotic factors does this burrowing owl require in life? Well, it would need a certain type of soil that's going to be stable so that it, their um, burrows don't collapse. Um, just looking at the picture, I would say the, the grass in the picture is probably important. I know that's biotic um, because the roots of the grass are going to like help to stabilize the soil. It would need certain temperatures. It would need certain water. Um, uh, and now we've talked about biotic factors in this owl's life. It would need some kind of food would definitely be a biotic um, factor that it, it needs, um, but other biotic components that will influence the owl's life would include things such as disease, competition between other species, um, even predators of the owl. Um, so when we look at both biotic and abiotic factors, that come into play for this owl and how it lives in the ecosystem. So its role in this in this habitat, this ecosystem, its place in the food web, all of those components, how it lives, where it lives, what does it eat, what it's it, what does it require for temperature, what does it require for the amount of water, who's competing with it, who is its prey, who is its predator, 
all of those parts make up this owl's ecological niche. Um, I don't think niche is the proper pronunciation, but I'm okay with that. And so when we look at this, um, just think about what a niche is before we move on. You're not summarizing in a box. Okay, so now can two species occupy the same niche at the same exact time? Well, here's one burrowing owl. Oh, here's another slightly different species of a, a different burrowing owl. Let's pretend that the um, biologists near my mom's property are worried about this owl going extinct. So they bring in another species, hoping that they interbreed together. Dun, dun, dun. And so um, they introduce this owl. But uh, this owl, this burrowing owl, species number two, is very similar to species number one. And it turns out they're not breeding together. So now they are um, kept as or defined as two separate species because they never make offspring together. And now they have intense competition because if they live in the same niche, that means every single factor and facet of their life is identical. They compete for the same food. They compete for the same water. They compete for the same resources. As far as like where are they gonna where are they gonna burrow, um, what time of day are they gonna eat? Every single component of their life is gonna be competition. So when we look back at this question, can two species occupy the same niche at the same time? Your answer should really be no. It's gonna lead to competitive exclusion. There's just way too much competition. And so um, they can have slightly different niches um, to help reduce the competition that is occurring between the two species, but they cannot occupy the same niche at the same time. Okay, and so because when we look at, like, here's some ants on a tree, for example. So um, let's say there's these lizards, and there's two different species of lizards that eat these ants. Um, well, you're going to have kind of intense competition for these ants. So now if these two species of lizards divide up the tree, as weird as that sounds, as they divide the resources and they partition it, Think about like cubicles in an office. Those are partitions. They've been, uh, the office has been divided. So if these different, two different species of lizards that are obviously pretty similar divide up the resources and use them slightly differently, it allows them to kind of live in the same habitat. So now we see here the gray species of lizards are going to feed on the ants at the bottom of the tree. Whereas the blue lizards that live near the top of the tree are going to feed on ants up there. So species have evolved to share resources within the wild. But they use them at slightly different ways. Because if they had direct competition, then uh, one species would, would die out, at least in that area. Sorry for the beeping. I'm making a video while I cook dinner. <laughs> um, and so when species divide a niche, to avoid competitions for resources, it's called resource partitioning. So they've partitioned the resources. And if you look down here at the bottom, you see this cute little, uh, this is not really cute, but this little message that says, because of resource partitioning, that leads us into a realized niche. Okay, so resource partitioning and how does it relate to the species niche goes in your box three. And our last part for this video is the fundamental niche versus the realized niche. So in a fundamental niche, this would be if there was no competition, the gray lizard species would um, live in the whole tree. That is fundamental or potential place where it could live. However, in reality, there's competition. And so therefore, the blue species outcompetes the gray species near the top. So the realized niche of the gray species is actually in this area of the tree. So the difference between a species fundamental niche and a realized niche go in your box four.